In what way do you consider being a Harry Potter fan to be a part of your identity as a whole? Like you all just said, to a certain extent, but like, in what way are you? Start. Um, I'm just gonna project. Right? Well, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. No, I'm not at all. <laughs> you all hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so I think that Harry Potter, because I did, because I started reading Harry Potter when I was about six years old, affects every part of my identity. From I'm a classics major uh, to like everything that I just do in my daily life. So I think that it's just very intertwined with my life, and I can't separate it from anything. Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely have a lot of elements um, that I think we'll kind of dive into about how like Harry Potter um, and sort of the way I related to it was very tied to like both my, my gender identity and like my queer identity. Um, but also like, you know, being a part of the fandom makes it a, very much a part of your identity even beyond the books. Like, I don't know who I would be if I weren't someone who'd been going to like LeakyCon and VidCon for the past few years. I definitely don't know who I would be if I hadn't been working for the Harry Potter Alliance for a long time. So for me, it's also like inextricably tied to my social and professional lives, which is weird when like you're out somewhere and someone just like casually brings up Harry Potter and you have to decide like, are you going to pretend that you're also just a casual fan? <laughs> Harry Potter, um, and I didn't put it down, and I was too stubborn 
to Gryffindor stubborn to uh, uh, stop engaging with the fandom early on. For a long time, that was the in, like to the extent of being on the internet, refreshing the Leaky uh, Lee Cauldron every day, downloading Wizard Rock on LimeWire, uh, <laughs> for which I've made up, I promise. Um, but then I kept at it, and through Nerd Criteria, actually Nerd Criteria was instrumental in me breaking into the community a little bit more. I started volunteering for the Harry Potter Alliance, and that became my job for a long time. And even though I don't work with the Harry Potter Alliance anymore, um, it still not only changed my life, but like laid new foundation for like upon which I built and rebuilt my life. Um, when I say as I said earlier in the like introduction round, that I was essentially raised by this community. It's not an exaggeration or a metaphor. It's like, um, to put it as briefly as possible, I was essentially on Privet Drive and in a very Dursley-esque household growing up. So all of my values and interests and convictions came either at first from absorbing this community through listening to the music or reading the meta or just watching it from afar to later being in the Harry Potter Alliance and um, having all of my role models and mentors and people who gave me places to live or people who have become like my close friends be from this weird corner of the universe. Um, so much like everyone else has expressed, I do not know who I would be without Harry Potter uh, and I think it is my identity in a way that's stronger than I relate to anything else. So. Wow. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. some of you already kind of touched on this, but what aspects of your identity would you say are the most strongly impacted by your involvement in the Harry Potter community? <coughs> Um, so I think that just my identity, even as a human being, and as the way I look at everything else, is really affect, like has really been affected by Harry Potter, and particularly the fan community. Um, the, I, I'm sure many of you have heard Lauren Farrell's song, It's Real For Us, um, and that song is really kind of captures how I feel about this community and how it affects everything else, and how I look at other communities I'm a part of, because I look at the, I also have that tattoo of it, <laughs> how I look at each community, including like my religious communities, as like a community that is real for the people within it, and it doesn't matter that much if it's not real for the people outside of it. Um, and so those other aspects of my life have been greatly affected by how I think about fandom, and how I am okay being unapologetically enthusiastic about Harry Potter, and then I'm okay being unapologetically enthusiastic about Roman history, or everything else that I am. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, listening to everyone talk, like, we sort of just very naturally moved from, like, like how the Harry Potter fandom influenced all of our lives, and I, I think that's sort of, like, one and the same with Harry Potter, the text, because, like, the values that are, like, here in, like, Nerd Criteria, and, like, more specifically the Harry Potter, like, fan community are things that I think a lot of us just sort of, if, if not, like, directly learned or the only place we learned these values, like, we, we sort of absorbed them from the books and, like, the fandom really lives out a lot of the best parts of Harry Potter. Um, and I think a lot of that for me, like, uh, because I've worked for the Harry Potter Alliance, I started volunteering in college, and it's been my, my like, full-time job for years. Uh, I learned how to be an activist through Harry Potter, um, through the text of Harry Potter and through the people in the Harry Potter fan community. Like, uh, some of the older people from the earlier days of the Harry Potter fan community, like, teaching me how to be a responsible consumer and, like, how to think about things critically. Um, and, of course, since my job was Harry Potter, I've learned a lot about the professional world <laughs> through Harry Potter and how to network with people. Um, but, you know, also, uh, Harry Potter was very important to, um, you know, figuring out my, like, queer identity um, and my gender identity growing up. Uh, <laughs> I definitely, uh, watching Prisoner of Azkaban, the, the movie, and the implied relationship between Remus and Sirius there was very <laughs> fundamental to realizing some things about my sexuality at age 13. Uh, went home, rewrote the whole end of Prisoner of Azkaban. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, man, most of them have essays or something. They don't post this as an essay. And then I discovered fan fiction. <laughs> and then I really learned a lot about myself. And I also like I don't I don't know that there was like 
too much um, related to like being trans that I really got from Harry Potter, like the text, but definitely from the fan community, um, like just from sort of like subtly making LGBT videos on the Harry Potter Alliance's channel, I like was just became surrounded by like so much love of people who were like, you know, this helps me and I relate to this, and so then when it was time for me to come out, I knew I had a giant support group of like welcoming people already, and like what a absolute like privilege to be able to be in a community where I didn't even have a of coming out to them. Like, that is amazing. And it's, I mean, we, it, I think that's down to all of us, but, you know, at the very beginning, it was J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter and the awesome values in that. Um, so, I think one thing that Harry Potter has done for me in particular is that my, growing up, my mother, it was just me and my mom, and she didn't want to impose any values on me, so she refused to talk to me about politics, she refused to talk to me about religion, she talked to me about some, like, you know, things like, you shouldn't steal things from people, um, was one thing that she really emphasized, so it's not, so I feel like a lot of what I learned about how to be, like, how to be an activist. Um, like my opinions on so many things were influenced by Harry Potter that I'm not sure that I know who I would be without Harry Potter, as we've been saying. Um, and I feel like so many things have been influenced, especially because, like I said, I don't have. A religion. I don't have a good religious community like I know that you do, um, and so like, so Harry Potter sort of like filled the void, <laughs> I, and it filled it with so much love and support and awesomeness from the community and from the people that I met through Harry Potter. That I think they, uh, the the books, the people, the everything, um, sort of just. Like absorbed into all of what I, uh, like who I am today, <laughs> is um, so much because of that. Like pretty much everything that I, uh, and interestingly enough, most of the media that I've been interested in, I got interested in because it was a crossover with Harry Potter fanfic. <laughs> uh, so almost every other book, TV, movie series that I liked as uh, as growing up. I mean, some things I discovered on my own, um, but a lot of it I discovered through not just fan fiction, but through meeting up with people, you know, geeking out over Harry Potter, and then they'd say, here's this awesome other thing, and then that's what I did. I mean, I, I wrote my uh, college essay partially about Harry Potter, or my MCAS essay about Harry Potter, I wrote my final seminar paper about Harry Potter. I just, yeah, I just, remember, I, I just remember I wrote a long research paper about Harry Potter slash fan fiction. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, Harry Potter shaped so much of my life. I'm not really, it's so much of my identity and how I learned and became a person that I don't know what I would be about it. And so, I don't think there's any one identity that's more influential than just my general community, how I act. <laughs> um, kind of going back to a little bit of what Jack said, I think that I view the world through a lens of Harry Potter, like through his glasses, if you will. <laughs> or through my snitch witches. Um, so, really snitch witches, guys. That's also part of my gender identity is half Harry Potter, half snitch witches. Um, so, I... I find myself going back to the books and to the canon, like I think people who are religious go back to their religious texts. Um, I don't have religion at all, like it's not something that I was raised with. Um, it was something that I was made fun of for a lot because people, I was, I was one of only, like I'm Jewish, so <laughs> um, I was, the, my brother and I were the only Jewish kids in our entire school district, so there was a lot of backlash because children are horrible when you are a child. <laughs> um, so Harry Potter has become, it's the moral, in a way, it's the, like, my moral code. It's something that I hold myself to, the way that 
love is like the weapon we have is love and people are not split into good people and death eaters and these are the things that I come back to so when I am deciding how I'm going to interact with people I look to that knowledge that I've gained from not only the canon but then again from the fandom from the things that I've learned from the people around me it, it's all it's inextricable to me like I, it's so much in that way, like, you know how you've read a fan fiction so many times that you can't remember if it's real or not? <laughs> like, yeah, that definite, no, it didn't. It didn't happen. You think it did, it didn't. Um, but that's how fandom is for me. It's completely inextricable from the text that I love and that we all love. So it's just the way that... I look at everything, so it influences everything I do, my professional career. I got to, I'm a music therapist, which is like my cool actual job, um, as opposed to my cool fake job. And I got to play Wizard Rock in a session one time, and the fact that I ran into another human being in the world that I didn't know who knew what Wizard Rock was was astounding in the first place, and then I got to use it in a session. It was so cool. But like, it influences everything I do, how I approach my clients and how I approach my friends, my family, everybody. So I've blathered on for a while. Can I just say you said pretty much everything I wanted to say? More eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> You're both very eloquent. Um, yeah, kind of bouncing off of that, uh, first of all, show of hands, how many of you are reasonably familiar with Wizard Rock? Just so I know a little. And how many of you are not? <laughs> Okay, uh, make sure you go to the yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, um, for, exactly that. Um, I mean, okay, so just so I know, like, if I don't want to um, have anything that I say be inaccessible or difficult to understand, but it looks like we're mostly on the same page. Um, I think definitely just reading Harry Potter growing up instilled a lot of values in me. Um, I. I can definitely relate to that whole thing about filling a void, but for me it was that my family, or my father in particular, um, was trying to act in my gut or wrong, even as a kid, like, um, things that I thought was cruel, uh, and I knew that I didn't agree with, um, and couldn't agree with the way that he treated me, or the way that he treated other people, or the way that he was encouraging me to look at the world. Um, and then I read Harry Potter, and I was like, this is what makes sense to me, this is what I believe in, this is what I want to stand by. But um, I think just the way our brains work, it's difficult to realize that you can put that in action when you're reading it out of a book that's based in fantasy and you know that, like, well, no, I was a kid, so I was like, when I'm 11, I'll go to Hogwarts and this will all be real, but for now, this isn't something I can actually do in my life the way that, like, Harry and his friends are sticking by their values and starting like underground activist organizations or making change in their communities or just like living by these values um and then i listened to wizard rock and it just like and then that got me into reading more about the fandom or even like i don't think it's a stretch to say that there would be no nerd criteria as we know it today and definitely not as we know it in this convention without harry potter or without wizard rock um I talk a lot about Wizard Rock, so I've done a lot of research on this, but like so much of it goes back to um, John and Hank's involvement with the Harry Potter community that came out of Akio's at the Palos and that entire early formative time of Nerd Criteria. Um, so seeing all of these spaces that were rooted in the, like, in all those beliefs in the books set to motion and set to music is what made me realize that my internal identity that I was developing out of the books and the movies and the fan fiction um, and the Wizzlenet like caption contests, all that, uh, I could... Uh, yeah. um, I, that's when I realized that I could live that way. And this was way before I had a job because of Harry Potter or had friends and effectively a family because of Harry Potter. But um, it was just like, oh, this is a thing. Like, it's real for us. Uh, trademark for your mother. <laughs> like, th this could just be a way that I live my life. Um, and now I've been thinking a lot. Uh, for context, I left uh, my job at the Harry Potter Alliance in October. So it's been a very, like, 
interesting few months because I started the Harry Potter Alliance when I was maybe you started the Harry Potter. I started, I started with the Harry Potter Alliance. Um, Jack was my boss at the HPA, and he's still out here reprimanding me. And um, yeah, what are you gonna do? Fire me? What if any role of a ten-year-old started the HPA? Maybe I did. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> when I started with the Alliance, I was maybe 15. Um, 15, yeah, yeah. I was 15, so like my entire formative years and my first job and my first like exposure to being a human outside of this like private drag situation that I've been confined to was through the HPA. And when that chapter of my life came to a close, I was like, who am I? I had wait. Um, <laughs> what am I? <laughs> I? I really hope everyone understands these. Um, I don't think I got that one. Oh, fake fan. Um, <laughs> I'll just leave now. <laughs> no, there's like this scene in Prisoner of Azkaban that's very overwrought where Harry is like, Chamber of Secrets, fake fan. Secrets. Prima is the only real Harry Potter fan I know. Um, what? And it's like the scene in the movie where right? he's like, "Who am I, Hedwig? What am I?" It's like everyone's giving him all the New York in a library, and I had like <laughs> in a library 
living in Henrietta, New York, which is this tiny town outside of Rochester, which is already kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it was just one of like this really shining moment for me where I felt complete, like I had felt really isolated in this situation, and I felt attachment to this group of people and to this fandom and to people who were going to be better to me than the relationship I was in and who were going to be better to me than the family I had to deal with when I went home from school. So I'm gonna like choke myself up, I have to stop. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I figured we would pile all the Wizard Rock responses together. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, I we're we're re re renaming this end of the table a rock stop. Um, yeah, just deep cuts all the way. Uh, okay, before I like actually answer, um, to bounce off of that, being at GeekyCon this summer, just after marriage equality had passed in the entire country, and um, after being a little kid hearing Matt singing "There's Nothing Wrong with It" and moved to Massachusetts, while I was coming to terms with my queerness. Um, and then after years and years being in that moment and hearing him say and hearing all of us scream, you can move to the United States of America, was, the best yeah, ever. there's a video out there and I cry every time. Um, but for my actual answer, honestly, every Wizard Rock show ever, um, just the fact that we can come together and sing songs about either queerness or just fighting for what's right or about when Hermione turned her song into a cat or whatever. Um, and like the continued reality of this very, very punk little corner, um, it just drives home how special this is and how unprecedented this is and how valuable it is. Um, and other than that, if there's one specific moment, it was probably when I got a job offer from the Harry Potter Alliance and realized that like, there was a place out in the world for me and it would buy me groceries. So this is not like a specific moment in the fandom, but it is a specific moment in my life in which the candle is really important to me. Well, there's two because they're really related. Um, so one is when I was in sixth grade, my sister, who was very severely disabled, had a really scary surgery, and I was in sixth grade, so I didn't understand what was going on. And I was scared, and everything was moving around me, and my parents were never home. Um, the one thing I always had with me was my copy of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Um, so I took this copy, which I still have, with me to the hospital with me when I was sitting there overnight with her, and everywhere for that whole year. And I think that by the end of the year, I kind of realized that, like, this book was never going away. Like, no matter what happened in my actual life, I was going to have Harry Potter by my side. Um, and then the second moment, which is related, is when I watched, I'm going to talk about Israel for us a lot. <laughs> uh, when I watched the video, the music video that Lauren made for Israel for us for the first time, and I was watching, I don't know how many of you actually have seen this video, but there's a kid reading Harry Potter on a bunk bed while their parents are fighting outside the door. Um, and that, like, I was that kid growing up. And watching that video made me realize that like, I wasn't the only kid who was that kid. Um, and so finding this place that I found, even if it's not like a real physical place, was incredibly life-changing for me because it gave me the confidence to keep going until I found that place where it was a physical. I knew this was going to be a question. I prepared a quote. What house are you in? Just out of curiosity. Oh, oh cool. I'm Slytherin, but I have just the littlest bit of Ravenclaw. And so like I have a lot of just a Ravenclaw. Well, I took the Hogwarts quiz nine times. <laughs> Harry and Dumbledore are 
discussing the implications of prophecy, and Harry is struggling with the idea that it's his destiny to be to defeat Voldemort, and it's this crushing weight placed upon him. And I've never had anything as dire as this, um, but I've also struggled for many years to find my place in society. And as part of several different minority groups who do not always get along, it's difficult for me to distinguish what I want to do, what I need to do, and what I have to do. And as the oldest child on both sides of my family, I have an obligation to my family to be an example, to be successful, to hold myself high because I am what my family models itself on in many ways. And like Harry, I have a responsibility. And his responsibility is towards an entire community, but mine is also towards the community. It's towards uh, this wonderful Harry Potter community and towards my younger cousins who look up to me. And um, so it all comes down to the point where Harry says it all comes down to the same thing. He's got to kill him, or the continuation of this is that Wilmer's going to kill me. Um, but Dumbledore sort of insists that Harry has to kill. Uh, that's funny. I said Harry has to kill Dumbledore, and my nose. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, yeah. But basically, um, Harry like Harry realizes that he wants to see Voldemort finished, and like, and I realize I don't want to work hard just because of expectations, but because I want to do the work and I want to help the world be a better place. Um, and so, uh, basically the quote at the end of the chapter is, but he understood at last what Dumbledore had been trying to tell him. It was, he thought, the difference between drag being dragged into the arena to face the battle to the death and walking to the arena with your head held high. Some people, perhaps, would say that there was little to choose between the two ways, but Dumbledore knew, and so do I, thought Harry, with a rush of fierce pride, and so did my parents, that there was all the difference in the world. And that made me realize that while I'm not Harry Potter, I can make a difference in the world. So, yeah. say that like one of the great privileges of, of my job where for the Harry Potter Alliance I'm our spokesperson I get to travel around and meet our members all around and go to conferences like this is I get to see a lot of people like you over the years grow up through high school and find your place and become a so like I'm just so proud of you right now that was so well spoken and you've just I, I don't know I've seen you grow and Claudia too I've seen you grow up over the years and like just so many people that I get to see over and over again and it's it makes me feel old but it makes me just like my heart grow three sizes yes totally yeah. um and now to return to the question uh, and to totally take it down. Um, so college was a really dark time for me. Um, I, I had a lot of like bad things happen in my life and I was dealing with like gender dysphoria and depression and um, uh, when I moved to New York halfway through college and I had been like aware of the, the fan community since I was like 12, you know, like podcasts and fan sites and wizard rock, uh, but I never like participated and I didn't like even online and I definitely didn't participate in real life but living in New York like a lot of things were happening there and so I started going to some things like Wizard Rock shows or the Deathly Hallows premiere with fans or just like Harry Potter Alliance events and every night when I would return from those events I would just be on this high like I felt so good and I felt so happy and it was like it was like I had just been to the best night of my life every single time um and like I didn't make any friends in college uh, when I was at NYU because um, I was just like this miserable, full of rage person. Um, but when I was at these like Harry Potter fandom events, I could have fun and relax and I made tons of friends and that's sort of what became my life after college. And so it was sort of those early moments like when I was in college and started going to fandom events where I, I, I think that was when I realized like, wow, this is, it's becoming a big part of my life and it should be because it's like, I'm sort of like finding my place in the world and it's actually making me see like the light and why I should stick around and that kind of thing. Wow. <laughs> okay, one final question before we move on to the Q&A. Do you think it's the canon, the community, or some combination of the two that has caused the world of Harry Potter to have such a huge impact on all of us? Or you specifically? Do you want to start? You don't have to. I can start. Okay. Um, so I think of, so I, I am relatively religious, I'm Jewish, and I think of it 
in a, I'm going to say this because I think of the way that Harry Potter plays a part in my life, similarly to how I think that Jewish text plays a part in my life, which many Jews would be very mad at me for, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I think of the canon or the text, um, and people are sort of doing this with Harry Potter and the sacred text now, which is lovely. I know, I'm so excited. That's anyway, um, the canon leads to the jumping off, is the jumping off point for all of this. See, not, like, in my opinion, none of this would exist had we not had the canon to start with. We needed that canon and those values, that initial text, to start creating our community. But I think it's both of those two things combined. And the community that, that has now goes out and like does wizard activism, which is a new <coughs> term that I have to learn how to define last year. <laughs> Yeah, my APA chapter and it's Wizard activist there. meet up at 7 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> um, has had a huge impact on me because that community has given me a place to be enthusiastic about the canon, even though the canon I loved to begin with. So I think it's a combination of both, both on the world and on this. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree. Like, I mean, you know, well, I was gonna say we wouldn't be here without. The, the text, but I don't know, maybe we would. But yeah, um, uh, I love, there's a quote from Hank uh, that the only time I've ever heard it was on the voiceover for a trailer for some fandom documentary that I'm not sure if it yes. ever got made. You know, you, you know, <laughs> yeah, wow, you know this deep cut, all right. Um, but he said, I think it's become a fairly common quote, if anything, just because I keep putting it all over HPA stuff. Um, but it's basically like, he was talking about being at LeakyCon, and he was like, for those of you who don't know, LeakyCon is a Harry Potter fan conference. He was like, we're not here because we love Harry Potter, we're here because we love the things that have been created around Harry Potter. Um, and that's a very important part of the community to me, is like, I mean, obviously we've created the community around it, but also like, I love how creative everyone in this community is, uh, the art that we all create from it. So, I mean, absolutely, and I think the folks down there are going to talk a lot more about the community side of it, which I think is very huge. Um, but I've also um, had to do like a lot of change people and affect their ideologies and perceptions of the world. Uh, and there was a, a very pretty well done uh, study of millennials, specifically like the Potter generation of how Harry Potter affected us. I'm sure you've all seen these clickbait titles. <laughs> I have read the full research paper on this. It's like a whole book. It's by Anthony Grzynski. You can check it out. It's called Harry Potter and the Millennials. Um, and, and definitively, like, reading Harry Potter made our generation more acceptant, accepting, more tolerant, uh, more anti-violence, just sort of like all of, all of these things where we've seen our generation more progressive, like, a lot of it is actually attributed to us all growing up with Harry Potter, which is wild to me. So I think the canon and the text, it does have a lot to do with it. Um, but yeah, for me, for me personally, a huge amount of it is the community that's been built around it. Um, yeah, I I feel like you all said such beautiful things <laughs> um, that uh, to, to an extent are true. I mean, I think that the books are so so important to me. As I said, they help me define the framework of basically who I am from these books, and they and I feel like the things that I learned from the books did form that sort of base of, of myself, but I think that it's the, it's definitely the community that has shaped it. It's like, um, like, okay, so this necklace, I made it myself, actually, and I carved it out of wax, and that was me carving it out of, like, the base thing, and then it got cast um, so that it is what it is today, and then I filed it down. So. Basically, what it's like is like the books were the wax, and then me reading them was carving it, and then getting it cast was throwing it back to the community and being influenced by the community, and then I filed it down and like made it into what it is, and it's something I wear every day since 2013 when I made it. <laughs> but yeah, so that's a really extended metaphor. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't speak as well in metaphors. That was really good. I'm very impressed. Yeah, what's your necklace? I don't want to wear jewelry at work, so I just stopped wearing jewelry altogether. These, okay, these don't come off. This is like, if I'm not wearing these, I don't feel like a human being. So, um, but otherwise, I'm not allowed to wear jewelry. I work with adults with disabilities, 
So wearing anything that dangles is difficult in case somebody has a difficult behavior. Mm -hmm. Don't want to choke. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I, um, I had so many things I was going to say. Um, I think that the, the canon is like, reading those books is like coming home, no matter where. It's like, I carry them around, I have all the book, like the PDFs on my phone and I carry them around with me all the time. Because if I'm ever anywhere and I need to calm down for a second, I read a Harry Potter book and then I feel better. And coming to a community is like being, like I jumped inside one of the books. It like, it feels like the most comfortable, homey feeling I've ever felt in my entire life. Like I've never gotten that in any other situation than being at specifically probably like wizard rock shows at conventions. It's like the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. And I don't ever want to give up doing like, doing these things and being around these people. And obviously none of us would be here if it weren't for, we wouldn't be in a Harry Potter space if there was no Harry Potter. So we need the books and I will never love anything like I love Harry Potter, but I think I like the community more than I like the Harry Potter at this point. I don't know how to explain it any better than that, but I, I'm like in the Harry Potter fandom fandom. <laughs> Um, this is where everyone's going to discover that I'm really, really cheesy, uh, and I speak in very cheesy metaphors, but it's kind of, it's like the canon, the story is my DNA, and it's always going to be my DNA, like, it, it's the beginning of my life, um, not just because I read it when I was six, so like, at the dawn of my consciousness, but because, like, everything I am goes back to that, um, but, so, the story is my DNA, but the community and everything that it's given me is the reason I am who I am and the reason I'm still alive, really. Um, there's one of the things that I did when I was first getting involved in the community was work on this book project called Dear Mr. Potter, which was a compilation of fan letters to Harry Potter um, or other characters thanking him and like explaining what the stories in the community did to us and this was before I um, joined the HPA, I joined it like a couple months after that or before I started coming to cons and all of that um, but one of my favorite things in that book was John's letter um, and I looked up the quote so I wouldn't get it wrong but he wrote, you've given me gifts dear Mr. Potter so real and lasting that I can't even really think of you as a fictional character anymore. Like so many other fans, I will carry you with me throughout my life, thinking of you not as a made-up character, but as an uncommonly generous friend. And it's one of those quotes that I return to a lot, just because it resonated so much with me, and just because I discover more layers of truth to it all the time. Um, but I, I think John, as he does, like said it better than I could, and I think it... I go back to that line about gifts a lot, um, and like the gifts that Harry Potter, the story, and the character has given me, whether it be like friendships that have saved me and continue to save me every day, or spaces and moments that like are both just bonkers and the fact that they're real, but also so important and sustaining to me that I can't imagine my life without them. Um, this may surprise you, but I'm talking about Wizard Rock. <laughs> Like, whether that be us crawling into Draco and the Malfoy's basement every, every three months um, to sweat a lot while some bands play songs about Harry Potter, or if it's like in huge convention halls where Harry and the Potters are tearing the house down with their amazing shows, can you tell that I really want all of you to go to the show tonight? Um, no, it's like, I'm, I'm biased. Um, but like it, it's a really good experience, um, or just like making dumb references on a panel, or being at these conventions. Like that's what my life is, um, and they are really, really big gifts that the story has given me. Yeah. Um. I've coped with through using Harry Potter, 
And I think things like, it, it taught me how to hope and how to have faith, which is something that I didn't have in my life. I came out really publicly, and I haven't told most of my immediate family because someone said, hey, can you write a thing? That person, that person did it. <laughs> the the Pacheco piece was the first time I ever said that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's having, kind of like Dax said earlier, the support to do that. And I think part of why I built this community is because something about this thing appeals to people who need those resources. And I was mm -hmm. wondering kind of what your feelings are on why that is or what it is. Yeah, I mean, I get asked all the time by, um, you know, sort of like professional partners who are outside of the fandom community, like, like, how is it, like, why are people so stoked in your organization? Or, or they'll ask, like, why, one thing I'd ask all the time is, why do we have so many queer and trans people in, in our, our, our demographics are, are, like, we're, like, over half queer, and, like, we have more, we have, we have 80%, like, 85% women, and then the rest of that is split between non-binary people and men. That's how we <laughs> can with the Harry Potter lines, generally. Um, and so people ask about that, and I'm like, well, I think it's because the story really resonates with underdogs, and because um, you're really, really taught like to accept anyone and to not just accept them, but to understand them and to have compassion for them and to fight for their rights and to have unconditional love for them. And that's just like, that message is, is in so hard in the books. Um, and another thing that, that's really great, um, someone uh, told me this metaphor one time and I, and I loved it, and they were specifically talking about being on the autistic spectrum, but like, going to Hogwarts, you don't get assimilated. So it's not like where, say, you are on the autistic spectrum, you might get, be get sent to a school to learn how to like, function in normal society and do normal people things. Um, you go to Hogwarts and everyone else is like you, and you're taught how to like use your gifts in uh, in a way that just like makes them even stronger and even more wonderful. And so I think all of that kind of really appeals to anyone who feels different. If I can add to that a little because I agree with everything Jack said. Um, but there are a lot of fandoms out there where the story is full of all the right stuff, but the fandom kind of goes bad or doesn't really put those into action. I think. There's a lot to be said for the fact that our community, and I mean both like Harry Potter and her criteria, is full of like Neville Longbottoms and Hermione Grangers who are very um, vigilant of what's going on and how we can improve, which isn't to like pat ourselves on the back because as anyone who knows the history of the fandom um, knows like we've come a long way, we've made a lot of missteps, there are a lot of like very dark moments that have happened in our community and there's so much that we can do to improve it. Um, but I think a lot about the reasons our community is why it is, and I think it's because of people like the founding members, the people who started the cons, or the earliest wizard rock bands, or people like Hank and John and their staff, um, making sure that what's at the heart of this community and what's present in everything they do and every way that they run a con and every um, the way that they interact with the community is founded in those values and affirmative of those values and just very like caring and conscious of all the humans and squids in, um, that's another weird reference that I realize now is lost on this room, um, in the community is the reason it stays that way from the source material. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, since we're saying sourced material, one thing that is coming to mind for me is when Harry, Ron, and Hermione are in the borough right before the wedding, and um, they're about, and Harry's trying to convince them to stay to stay behind while he goes and searches for the Horcruxes alone. I think it's Hermione who says something along the lines of like you said to us once that there was a time to turn back. Well, we've had time, haven't we? In, that's referring to the first book, obviously I'm about to go for the Philosopher's Stone, but it also sort of resonates that through the entire series, the unifying thing between Harry, Ron, and Hermione is their friendship. Even when Hermione's bossy, or Ron like, does something silly that like, makes it more mad at him. Um, and so, I think that's like, a lot of what the community is founded on. Oh, I can't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something to say. You all are so eloquent. Um, I think that, like Jack said, this community picks up people who 
feel like they don't have the place or the necessarily, not necessarily the book, but like the canon to be who they are. Um, I think Harry Potter gave me a lot of the language, kind of feeling like, um, the example I always use is Chamber of, Chamber of Secrets, when Harry feels like he's going crazy and like there's things in his head that are not being seen by everyone else who's around him. And I had that experience a lot when I was younger, and I didn't have a way to talk about that. But then if I have Harry Potter feeling that, I feel a lot less alone, and it gives you the language to talk about. We take care of our own. Next question comes to my Uh, I have two young nieces, and they're just starting to read, which is really exciting. Um, but I was wondering uh, what you guys would think about for young readers, how do we encourage them to use Harry Potter to explore their identity without imposing our own knowledge and our own coming to terms with our identities on them? Like, how do we encourage them to read the books in the same way that we did? I struggle with this a lot. I think my partner and I uh, talk a lot about how what happens when we have children and what if they don't like Harry Potter. <laughs> I can be okay with any single thing that that child hands to me, but if they don't like Harry Potter, I don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> um, but I, I think that the, the most that you can do is try to... I'm not a parent. I don't know that anybody... Is anybody up here a parent? Or, okay. No. Just, just checking. Um, so, as a non-parent, but as somebody who's done a lot of caretaking, for vulnerable people. I think the most you can do is to try to put the good values that you have learned from Harry Potter into them, and then hopefully that those values will resonate as they're reading the books as well. Like, it's all thing we all learned either from our families and were reinforced by the books or learned from the books that were reinforced by other positive people in our lives. So giving that same experience to them, and if they don't find it in Harry Potter, like, Hopefully they find it in something else that they love. Yeah, and also I think you're in a good position to be the cool uncle. I mean, it might be harder for parents. <laughs> Kids are like, I don't want to like my parents like, but oh, the cool uncle likes Harry Potter. I'm going to like Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah I think uh, either way, an important thing is to show them how possible it is to live by those values. Um, whether, again, not a parent, but seeing a lot of my friends becoming parents in this community, I think it's so cool that those kids are being brought to cons, or if not, just being shown communities like these in, in one way or another. Um, and I think that's what set the entire trajectory of my life when not my parents, but like when people I looked up to in the community um, were living this specific way, and therein living out those values that made me realize that that was possible and also made me like kind of sift through the values that I wanted to follow in my life. And I think another example of that is Nerd Criteria and like how we saw John and Hank and then like the ever-growing community acting these things out both in the videos and in events like Project for Awesome and stuff. Yeah. I, um, I have, like I alluded to earlier, I have a lot of small cousins. I um, have ten first cousins and the closest and, um, and some of them, the closest in age is like eight years, nine years, ten years, fifteen years. I have cousins eighteen years younger than me, actually. But I'm just way older than one, and so I am kind of that like cool cousin who has the Harry Potter books. Um, and uh, I actually, and so one thing that I did was I uh, just gave them the entire set of Harry Potter books. And said like, look, you can uh, like I got a lot of these, and I learned a lot from them. And here's the entire box set. Just read it when you're ready. <laughs> uh, and my one of my cousins, I gave her the books when uh, like maybe two or three years ago, but it wasn't until about a year ago that she started reading them, and because like that's when she really got into them. And now she is really, really jealous whenever I go to a Harry Potter thing and don't bring her. <laughs> she's like, she's 13, so she's like really into it. Um, and so what I feel like is not just, not like to impose like our values on people, but like just give them the text to find what they will from it. Um, and yeah, it's for, for, for my cousins and 
now we talk and have actual discussions about different issues um, related to the Harry Potter books. Like, I have one of my cousins, he's nine years younger than me, he'll just read, and he read the Harry Potter books, and he'll come to me and he's like, well, why are they doing this thing? Why are they, why are they doing this? Why, they, they, you know, like, why are the Dursleys so mean? <laughs> like, and we have discussions about it. Uh, you you were almost out of light. Yeah. Are you yeah. sure? Yeah. Matt, you sure? Yeah. Uh, all right. You don't, you don't have to. <laughs> First of all, I just wanted to thank J.K. Rowling because she her name hasn't been mentioned. Um. So I was in the midst of raising my daughter when Harry Potter started, and they would come on Saturday morning, and she would read them. Monday morning came and she went to school, and I read them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I come from a trauma background, and I think Privet Drive is a um, metaphor for trauma backgrounds. And um, the books are just so brilliant in helping people heal from that. So I know that as a counselor, um, and I know that from my own healing process. So I just wanted to say that for both my own healing and for raising my daughter, Harry Potter, which came from the mind of this wonderful woman, and it's so amazing to be in this conference today and hear so many people call themselves creators within this sphere of values. It's just beautiful. So thank you. Thank you. Um, kind of bouncing off of that, I think abuse, the way that Harry faced it, but also to see a character living through it and coming out a good person who did good things and that is so so important um and because we're at nerd conner criteria another thing that definitely does that is the music of the mountain goats which like follows a lot of that like overcoming abuse and trauma uh thing um sorry just real quick i know we're running out of time um i'm gonna say that the thing I've been realizing very recently, actually, how many great mental health metaphors there are in Harry Potter. Um, and talking to people, like, in both my mental health communities and my Harry Potter communities, about how we can put those two things together, because I really, really agree with you that Primate Drive is such a good way, like, way to explain trauma to people who haven't necessarily experienced trauma, um, because I find that very difficult, especially as someone like a college student, a relatively young person who's trying to explain it to my peers and I but using Harry Potter as a tool is incredibly yeah, I think the place we're at right now in the world is one where a lot of people are trying to shy away from or shame people who use story as a way to understand the world and explain the world. But stories don't come from thin air. They come from other people who've lived lives and they really, like, they do give a shorthand where, like, if I say I was abused, like, a lot of people who haven't gone through that or even who have but had different experiences can't process that. But if I say it was private drive, people are like, whoa, the Dursleys. Bad news. Um, and that applies to everything from personal experiences to the political climate, and that's the basis of the Harry Potter Alliance, which has like over 10 years now, um, like to show for it. Oh, uh, yeah, almost 12, we're seven years. Whoa. <laughs> uh, watch out for basilisks. Sorry, what's that? Watch out for basilisks. What's that? Oh. <laughs> You'll figure it out. You don't want yours. One last question. My question was, is what do you do when someone has a value system that is wholly incompa incompatible with your own? Like, what do you do with that? Okay, so I am the only Democrat in an entire extended family full of Republicans. Um, and I am a queer ace person living in a family with an autistic younger brother and everyone voted for Donald Trump in my family. Every single person. Um, and I don't know why they thought that effectively ending the lives of their children was a good idea, but that was fine. Um, so my answer is first and foremost, do what you have to do to protect yourself. Um, I do whatever I can to avoid politics with my family because it is just much safer for my mental health. But if you are in a situation in which you cannot do that, only do as much as you can feasibly do. Like, do your best to have a calm and collected conversation with somebody, but 
don't do it at the expense of your own sanity and your own physical health because it's not, it's never worth it. Like you, at the end of the day, you have yourself and you will have yourself for the rest of your life. And that self has to be protected. And that can happen through hanging out with other people who do have your own views, but at the end of the day, you have you and nothing else. So that was darker than I meant it to say. <laughs> You have, you, you have to protect yourself because you're a lovely, beautiful human being who deserves to be protected. There we go. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. that's very, like, yes. <laughs> uh, if, and I just want to add, like, if you are in a place where it's, like, someone that you can be interacting with, um, I think John put it really well in his video he made after Election Day where he was talking about, like, one of the reasons that we kind of got to this point is because we do have these huge echo chambers in our community where a lot of people like the people like all of us here we're getting our news and our information from one source that is completely different from somewhere else and there's just like we've got to start breaking down those echo chambers so when you are in a position to be able to have discussions with people just like try to remember the humanity in each other and try to um you know don't resort to like overreacting judgments and stuff like that um, because as hard as it is and as much as it you may not want to do that I think that's gonna be what sort of saves our future.